Hi everyone, my name is Jessica McAnulty and I'm a PhD student here at U of M. Uh, and today I'd like to talk to you about how that medicine at your home first started into the laboratory and the process it took to get there. So first I'd like to start off with what is research? And I'd like to hear your definitions of this question. How would you summarize research? Finding new knowledge. Finding new knowledge, okay. Any other suggestions? Testing ideas. Testing ideas, great. So um, another definition could be answering a question by gathering information. So we wonder what else is in outer space, what lives in the depths of the ocean, and what is a cure to cancer? So these are all really big research questions that scientists are working towards. And so uh, personally, I work in a lab studying ovarian cancer, and so today we'll focus a little bit more on tools that scientists use to answer these questions specifically within disease. So there are several different uh, living things that scientists will study to help learn about uh, potential medicines. So what do we see here circled in these, um, what do we see circled? <laughs> Cells, great, so that's at the top. People, and what was that? Perfect, animals. So all of these are very important tools for the scientists to help understand disease. And specifically with cells, um, some common definitions associated with cancer, um, there are, there's one kind of like hallmark that is always talked about. So when we look at cell division, right, so cells are going to multiply, they're going to continue to grow, that's normal. Cancer cells, though, they can grow at a faster rate, and there's something else about their growth. Does anyone know? So when we get hungry, our stomach is telling us, okay, we need food, let's get it full, and you eat, and you're full, and another signal goes to your brain to say, okay, stop eating. Cancer cells will disregard that signal. So cancer cells will continue to grow, even if there is any kind of signal saying stop, don't grow, um, and this is really a hallmark of cancer. So keep that in mind. So now when um, scientists go to develop some kind of potential medicine, it has to um, be carefully tested by a specific administration. Do we know what that administration is? FDA. The FDA, very good. So you may recognize these medicines at home. These all have an active ingredient that had to undergo a really long testing process. So here I have a figure to kind of represent the amount of potential compounds or medicines that we start with and ultimately end with one. There are several different phases involved with uh, this drug discovery. And so any guesses as to how long this could take or how much it could cost? Shout out just to your wildest guess. Years, okay. And what was that? 20 years, okay. Any guess on cost? Okay, great guesses. So it's actually 14 years, and now current estimate is about $2 billion. The price of drug discovery has actually been increasing. And so, huh? For one medication? Just for one, yeah, exactly, one medication. So obviously this is a very costly process and timely process, and just to quickly go through these different steps, um, initially, we start with drug discovery and development, so you want to try to find some kind of chemical or compound that will target the disease in some way. So in the case with uh, cancer, we would hope to stop those cells from dividing or potentially just kill the cancer cells altogether. So if we have a drug that does that, great, we can move on to the next step in preclinical pre research. So what do you see up here on the slide? Mouse. So we use animal models here at this stage to understand how that compound affects the whole organism. And this is all very carefully regulated. And it's important that we have this so that we understand the different side effects that we could see upon treating with this compound. So as you notice, if we start with thousands and thousands of compounds, only about 250 will move on to the next stage. Now we move on to clinical trials. How many compounds do you think will move on to this next stage? Just take a guess. Ten. That's an awesome guess. So it's about five of these initial thousand. Uh, so what do we test in clinical trials? Humans. So now we're, we're not testing humans. I should rephrase that. We're looking at compounds in humans and if they are safe, if we have the correct dose. And lastly, are they actually doing what we hope for them to do? So in a cancer model, we would hope that these would be killing the cancer cells. So if we are successful, there are multiple phases of clinical trials. Uh, if the compound is great, it's safe, effective, it'll move on to FDA review, and this will just be um, the FDA reviewing all the data that have been generated, um, and then putting it onto the market for patients to have. So even once it's actually approved, there's still this post-market monitoring. So, yes? Does the FDA know anything 
about the trial to the research to the, are they just the gatekeeper or are they involved early on? Very good question. So uh, the FDA will review all of this data that has been generated. So um, there's a separate um, kind of gatekeeper which is called like the IRB, so International Review Board, and that's when we do studies with humans. They want to make sure everything's safe. Um, but the FDA will look at all of this data to say, okay, this all makes sense. Um, it's a very good question. So uh, even once the drug is approved, it'll be continued to be monitored. So do we have any idea why they care about this? Great, yeah, long-term studies. So our clinical trials, even though this whole process takes 14 years, it's distributed among each step. Drug discovery and development is actually kind of the longest. That could take about six. The clinical trials is gonna be relatively short, maybe two to three years. So if we have a patient that requires to be on this drug for five years, we wanna know if there could be any side effects arising. So that's why we have this post-market monitoring where patients are able to take the drug, but it's still being reviewed. Uh, but it is considered safe. And so, um, Again, we said that this drug discovery process can take 14 years. So how can we improve the cost and time of drug discovery? What if we were to go back to drugs that have already been approved and gone through this process? So this is called drug repurposing. So this is when we're studying a disease that has already been approved to treat, um, sorry, studying a, a medicine that has been approved to treat one disease, such as maybe type 2 diabetes, but we find what if this medicine could also be approved to treat something like cancer? And so uh, there have actually been several drugs um, that are trying to be repurposed for ovarian cancer, one of which is actually type 2 diabetes medicine. So looking at this timeline, so this was the original kind of figure I show, depicting the amount of compounds that go in, the amount of time um, leading to approval. But if we do drug repurposing, we can see that we're decreasing the time, it's a much cheaper cost, and we're leading to a higher approval rate because we already have all of that initial data on that drug discovery, that six-year process, has already been completed. And so um, I'm a member of the DeFeo lab here at U of M, and we are studying ovarian cancer, and we completed a computer screen to help identify are there any FDA-approved drugs that could have some kind of efficacy or success in killing ovarian cancer cells. So we identify there's actually a heart medicine um, that could be uh, effective. And so first, I want to show you a picture of some cells. So this is a cell line we work with in the lab. Now cells are very, very tiny, right? So we use a microscope to see them. So these dark purple blobs are the cells residing on the plate. But then cancer cells can just grow uncontrollably, right? So these white spots above are actually more cells just stacking on top. And they're brighter because um, they're not fully attached like uh, the other cells are. But the point is, the cells here are very happy, they're growing, they've been on this plate for two days um, and really taking off. But when we treat with this heart medicine, we see that there's a lot um, of this white space. So first up here, that's just our cluster of cells, but then all this blank space is truly blank space. So we were able to prevent the cells from growing and even killing some of the ovarian cancer cells. So this is very exciting to see, but um, as you can imagine, this original drug was made to um, help with the heart. So this is uh, actually called amiodarone. It's meant to stabilize the heart rhythm. So if we were to give a heart medicine to a patient with ovarian cancer that does not have a heart problem, can you identify any potential side effects? Could maybe affect their heart, right? And they don't need that. So we are working with medicinal chemists who um, can help us uh, change this molecule around a little bit. So this is the chemical structure of the heart medicine and they identify that this area here is what's affecting the heart rhythm. So we're hoping that we can just remove this and create different versions of this drug and see if it's still able to kill the ovarian cancer cells, but then no uh, longer have this side effect with the heart rhythm. So overall with this talk, I hope you got an idea of the different steps in drug discovery, the time and cost it takes that's associated with it. However, with the um, use of drug repurposing and using computational models to identify other potential FDA-approved drugs that could be used for a different disease, we're drastically decreasing the time and cost associated with drug discovery, and this is something being implemented here at U of M. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, like I said, I'm Jessica McInulty, part of the DeFeo Lab. We're located over here at uh, North Campus Research Complex, and I also have here um, a little QR code to scan for mysciwriters.com. This is a blog run by graduate students that talk about different um, science going on at the university or just uh, worldwide. And we 
uh, remove all the technical jargon associated with it. Uh, so thanks again, and I'm happy to take any questions.